Some people post lengthy comments underneath my videos. Some are complimentary, some are short little nutrition sermons, and some are downright ugly. And do I ever read them? What about those nasty mocking criticisms? The following video is my way of responding. In this video, I want to address some of the frequent comments, questions, and complaints that people post underneath my videos. And yes, I do read them. Let's get started. One question I get asked frequently is, are you a diabetic? Now, I talked about this on the last video that I posted, but I want to expand on it a little here. The answer to the question, are you a diabetic, totally depends on how I eat. If I eat one way, Yep, I'm a diabetic. If I eat a different way, nope, I'm not diabetic. And there is a powerful truth in this. In Dr. Michael and Mary Ede's book, Protein Power, they share a study done by Dr. Karen O'Day in which she convinced a group of middle-aged diabetic aborigines in America to return to their homeland in Australia and eat and live the way they had when they were in their younger years. They had been non-diabetics while in Australia, but they came to America, adopted the standard American diet, gained a lot of weight, and became diabetic. They agreed to go back and live in Australia for seven weeks in the bush, just as they had done before coming to America. As they wandered through the bush area of Australia, they ate a diet that was nearly two-thirds meat and animal products. Their carbs were cut significantly, and there was no sugar to be had, so they had to give that up cold turkey. After seven weeks of this diet, Dr. O'Day and her associates checked their blood lipids. Their glucose levels fell from an average of 210 to 118. In other words, they went from severely diabetic to non-diabetic. Their insulin levels were nearly cut in half, and their average triglycerides fell from 354 to 106. They weren't exercising at the gym. <laughs> there were no gyms in the bush. Nor were they even walking all that much. Meandering would come closer to describing their physical activity. So were these men diabetics or weren't they? Well, that depends. Put them in America, eating the standard American diet, and yes, they were serious diabetics. But place them in the Australian bush, living as hunter-gatherers, and they were not at all diabetic. And I see myself the same way. If I'm eating the way most Americans eat, I'm surely diabetic. But I don't eat the way that most Americans eat. My carbohydrate intake is well below most people, and therefore my numbers say I'm not diabetic. Another question I'm often asked is if I take diabetic medicine or insulin. And the answer is no, I don't. I can get my blood sugar levels close to their normal range, so there's no reason for me to take insulin or any diabetes medication. But I don't suggest that nobody should ever take diabetes medications. I'm sure some people need it and would be badly off without it. Type 1 diabetics definitely need to take insulin. There's no way around that. But I've heard many testimonies from people who were nearly the worst, the most extreme diabetics, and were able to bring their blood sugar down close to normal without medication. So I know that for many type 2 diabetics, it is definitely possible to get close to normal glucose levels without medications or perhaps taking medication at first and then gradually dropping it. But that's a matter for you to work out in close consultation with your doctor. So talk to your doctor about that. Some folks love to ask me, don't you know the cause of insulin resistance and type 2 diabetes is animal fat and animal products? I get this a lot from our vegetarian and vegan friends. They've been fed this line so often by their nutritionists of choice that they've come to believe it without question, and they expect all the rest of us to believe it as well. But let's use a little logic here. If insulin resistance and type 2 diabetes were exclusively caused by eating animal products, then no vegetarians or vegans would ever become type 2 diabetics. And this just ain't so. Cardiologist Dr. Asim Malhotra is of Indian background, but he lives in London, and he's become one of Britain's superstar physicians. He's on TV all the time. They love to interview him. Since he's Indian, the Indians in Britain love to come to him, and he reports all kinds of vegans and vegetarian Indians who are full-scale diabetics. 
If meat eating was the sole cause of diabetes, there wouldn't be a single vegan or vegetarian Indian who's diabetic, at least not with type 2 diabetes. And speaking of India, there's no larger population of vegetarians and vegans than you'll find in India. Whenever I fly internationally and sit near someone of Indian nationality, it seems that more times than not, they'll get their food before everybody else. And the reason is, they always seem to request a vegetarian meal. And yet India, with all its millions of vegetarians, is suffering a huge epidemic of diabetes these days. Not because they've all become carnivores, but because they've discovered the sweetness of sugar and pastries. Plus, they love their chapatis, their naan, and other bread products. And while it's true that not all Indians are vegetarians, the truth is that even the non-vegetarian Indians eat very little meat. They'll often have a big plate of rice covered with curry sauce with tiny little bits of meat in the sauce. I know this because I've been to India many times and I've eaten many meals among the Christians there. And Africa is pretty much in the same boat. Most Africans eat little meat, not because their religion prohibits it, but because meat is just too expensive for them to consume great big steaks or jumbo-sized hamburgers. If a low-meat diet was the key to defeating diabetes, few Africans would get it. But in Africa, they too are seeing a huge surge in type 2 diabetes due to the increasing amount of sweets, sodas, bread, wheat, and corn products that they're consuming. Some people ask me, why do you test at one hour? Everybody knows you should test at two hours. The reason for my one-hour test is that I'm looking to discover my blood sugar peaks. When does it reach its apex and then start its way back down? Once my blood sugar is on its way down, I lose interest in it. Whether it takes one or two hours to get back to its base level really doesn't matter to me. What I want to know is, how high will this food or this meal spike my blood sugar. If I can keep those peaks under 140, and normally I prefer them no higher than in the 120s, then I know I'm doing pretty good. My fasting blood sugar will stay in line. My A1C scores should be just fine. Just keep those blood sugar spikes under control, and life is good. Now, people are different, and not everybody peaks at the same time. People with an overactive pancreas will probably peak much quicker than those with a sluggish pancreas. And the food you eat can make a difference. A potato is going to cause a blood sugar peak much, much faster than a bowl of beans. Bread will cause a peak faster than barley. So there's no perfect time to test that works for all people in all situations. But for me, testing myself an hour after finishing my meal is a pretty good general time to test. If I waited to test at two hours for many meals and many foods, I would be clueless as to what my blood sugar peak was. When my wife and I did a test where we ate three large fruits, we both found that our highest blood sugar was at 30 minutes after eating. By an hour, our blood sugar had already started on its way down, and by two hours, our glucose levels were lower still. Waiting to test at two hours after eating would not make sense and would not give us the important information we need about the severity of our blood sugar spikes. The most popular video I posted on the channel at this point involves a blood sugar comparison test that I did on myself. I tested after eating two Hershey chocolate bars, and then the next day, I tested myself after eating two large bananas. Now, when I call it the most popular video, I don't mean it was the one people liked the most, but this video was the one people have watched more than any other up to this point. The test showed that the candy bars peaked my blood sugar at 169, and the bananas spiked it all the way up to 122. This was a bit of a surprise to me. For some people, it was more than a surprise. It drove them crazy. I was accused of working for the Hershey Company. Some people asked me in derision, don't you know that bananas are natural and healthy for you and candy is junk? Well, first let me assure you that I do not work for the Hershey Company, nor was I suggesting that we should just quit eating all fruit and start eating candy bars every day. Of course candy bars are unhealthy for you. I chose them for this test for that reason. I didn't think the bananas would raise my blood sugar higher than the chocolate bars, but I did figure they'd probably raise it almost as much. I was trying to take a food that everybody knows is unhealthy for us, the candy bars, and demonstrate that fruit, which so many people see as the perfect food, can be a blood sugar spiker for diabetics 
almost as much as a nasty candy bar. And of course, I was right, at least when it comes to my own body. You can test yourself and see how it works for you. But the point was not that chocolate bars are good. It was that fruit can be a real problem for diabetics. And that test ended up making that point far more vividly than I expected it would. A couple of people complained that the test wasn't fair because the bananas were bigger and had more bulk than the candy bars. But the size and bulk of food have little relationship with raising your blood sugar. A big bunch of cotton candy weighs almost nothing, but it will raise your blood sugar far more than a two-pound steak. A bowl of Rice Krispies weighs very little, but it will spike blood sugar much higher than two sticks of butter. When it comes to raising blood sugar, carbohydrate content is the name of the game. The bananas and the candy bars had nearly an equal amount of net carbs, and that was why I compared them. And of course, I get comments ever so often from someone who says something like, well, I can eat 10 bananas and a couple of mangoes and my blood sugar doesn't rise at all. Well, good for you. <laughs> That's like an expert swimmer mocking a non-swimmer saying you can drop me off a boat five miles from shore and I can swim to shore easily with no problem. Well, maybe you can, or maybe you're just boasting, but the non-swimmer definitely cannot. Diabetes simply means you don't process carbs and sugars the way that normal people do. They raise your blood glucose to dangerous levels. If you really can eat 10 bananas and see no blood sugar spike, then you're simply not diabetic. And what are you doing watching this channel anyway? My wife, for example, ate two huge blueberry muffins with something like 110 total grams of carbs. And within an hour, her blood sugar had gone from 97 to 99. Well, that was great for her, but it clearly demonstrated she's not diabetic. It didn't prove a thing about blueberry muffins being okay for diabetics. Well, actually, there are low-carb blueberry muffins that will work for diabetics, but that's another story for another time. I received complaints when I did a test where I went to several fast food restaurants and removed the top buns from my sandwiches. People just hated me and criticized the whole idea of ever going to these restaurants where the buns and the meat are processed and nothing is really totally natural. Well, I'll confess that in the ideal world, we would all eat nothing but pure, natural, organic, non-processed foods, and I'm sure we'd all be the better for it. But guess what? This is not the ideal world, and most of us have to make a few compromises here and there. Sometimes I'll get together with one of my children for a quick breakfast before we both have to go about our day. I love to see them, and often we end up at a fast food restaurant. Sometimes I'll buy a breakfast sandwich, take off the top bun and eat the rest, drink some coffee, and I'm good. I'm not really there for the food. I'm there because I love my children and I love every chance I can get to be with them. I'm not so persnickety that I'm going to insist, if we can't eat beef from free-range, grass-fed cattle, I'll never go to that restaurant with you. <laughs> One lady commented, why would you ever go to a fast food restaurant? Aren't there Vietnamese or Thai restaurants around you? I told her, I guess I'm just too common. The truth is, it's never been and is not now the goal of my life to become a food connoisseur or a nutritional expert. I enjoy my life, and my life is a whole lot bigger than the foods that I eat. Now, I have to watch my diet for the sake of my blood sugar, but beyond that, I have no desire to get too radical in every aspect of the foods that I eat. This channel is not aimed for the food experts who study diet and foods all their waking hours. This channel is for common, ordinary Americans and Canadians and Indians and Pakistanis and people all over the world who've just come home from the doctor's office after hearing those terrible words, you are a diabetic. If I can help them get over the fear and encourage them in a way of eating that will bring those A1C and fasting levels down, I am well satisfied. Now, many of them will go far beyond me in their knowledge of nutrition, and that's fine. I'm just happy to do my little part. Some people make comments about food and nutrition that I read and say to myself, wow, I never knew that. Some of you who regularly watch my videos are far more savvy about nutrition than I am, and we can learn from each other. Well, I've talked about some of the comments and complaints I get, but let me share one of my greatest surprises I've had since starting this YouTube channel. The surprise is this. I can't get over just how angry people can get with me when I apparently speak against their diet of choice. It's not that I expect everybody to agree with me on everything. Of course, people are going to disagree with me on certain things, and they have every right to. 
I'm not the sum of perfect knowledge, in case you haven't figured that out yet. But what is surprising is how vehemently people will disagree and how hateful they can be. They'll not just tell me I'm wrong, they'll tell me I'm an idiot, I'm a fool, I'm completely stupid. They'll mock me and attack me personally. It doesn't really anger me as much as it puzzles me. At first, I didn't get it at all. After all, we're primarily talking about diet here. How can one's choice of diet make a person that angry? But I think I finally figured it out. Actually, it took two comments for me to get it. The first person ridiculed me and made a hateful comment, and the second person followed up by telling me not to pay attention to the first one and said that their particular diet is their religion. And then it made a little sense to me. For some people, their diet is their God. They so identify with what they eat or with what they refuse to eat that if anyone dares to suggest that one of their favorite foods can be detrimental to diabetics or that their entire diet is far from ideal for diabetics, they go ballistic. I haven't simply disagreed with their choice of foods. I've insulted their God. Well, all I can say is if your diet is your God, you have a pretty puny God. I believe in the low-carb diet, but it's not my God. I mean, can you imagine someone on their deathbed praying to bananas and mangoes, saying, take me to yourself, I've lived my life entirely for you? Well, let me close by saying that my goal is not to create a bunch of little dentists in the YouTube world, eating like I do, talking like I talk, and using the same expressions that I use. I'm primarily sharing my story to give you hope that you can make it. You really can beat diabetes. See a good doctor, find a diet that lowers your blood sugar and keeps those spikes in a reasonable range, and dare to believe that your best is yet to come.